Kate, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. It's funny, it sounds like I'm speaking to myself when I say, <laughs> say hello, Kate. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> um, so uh, you have a fascinating background, um, and I want to start with um, the Amish first, your background there. What was it like growing up Amish? Um, it was very interesting. I mean, back when I was growing up, that is what I knew. And since I left, I am reminded again and again how similar it was um, to other communities and societies, um, but also how different it was. You know, there were mm. incredible advantages and disadvantages to the way that I grew up. Um, I mean, the advantage of being in a close-knit family and community like that was really incredible. Um, you know, the connection with family. I didn't watch television growing up. We weren't sitting on our cell phones. Um, so time spent with family uh, was very present. And I didn't have that distraction when I was a child. So I spent a lot of time outdoors, running around, exploring. You know, I, I lived on a large farm. So I spent a lot of time just reading underneath the trees, reading in, in the fields, in the middle of, uh, you know, nature. So that was definitely a big advantage. And then, you know, there were also disadvantages such as I was taken out of school when I was in ninth grade. So that definitely, uh, you know, the start of my life was very different than what the majority of other people in America would experience. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I still feel the effects of that today where I, you know, I don't have the knowledge that comes from being in school from such a young age to, you know, graduating college like most people do. I had to actually go back and do that myself when I was older. Which you did. Which yes. Is, which uh, I did, admirable. Yes. I think in general, it was very similar, you know, like, as I said, like, as I spend more time, you know, outside of the community, I realize how much the fundamental parts of my life were very similar to other communities. Hmm. And you, do you come from a long line of Amish? How far back does it go? So I don't know, you know, the extensive family history, but uh, the majority of Amish people have, you know, they come from families that have been Amish for centuries. Um, and I, you know, to the best of my knowledge, that's you know, my story as well. Right. And you were the daughter of the uh, community's bishop, which I can imagine puts also a lot more strain on you. Yes. So my fa my father was the, the, minister, the um, minister of the church, and he was ordained when I was nine years old. So as the minister's children, you're expected to have a lot more integrity. You're expected to follow the rules a little bit more closely. And I was a very rebellious child. Um, you know, if you know the way the Amish dress, they all, you know, wear their hair the same way. They all dress in uh, the same kind of outfit. And the day my father was ordained, I was like, well, when they tell me to, you know, comb my hair a little tighter, I'm just going to make it a little, a little bit more dramatic, you know, like that. <laughs> a little different. That was, yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of the attitude that I had at nine years old about my father becoming the minister. So it definitely you know, made a big impact on my childhood. <laughs> mm. And do you remember, um, I mean, this podcast is called The Pivotal Moment. Do you remember the pivotal moment when you realized that you no longer belonged in the Amish community? And I think to break that up into two moments, it would be first the moment where you realized that you were mentally realized um, that you wanted to leave. And uh, the second moment, the moment that you physically left the community. You know, leaving the Amish is never one specific moment. It's usually a buildup of, you know, decisions and actions that are taken. Um, you know, when I moved out of my parents' house, I was 18. But before then, I had a radio. I was, you know, hanging out with my friends and we would go bowling. We would do things that we weren't supposed to do. Um, so it wasn't like a specific moment when I was like, okay, I'm no longer going to be Amish. It was just kind of like, a gradual adopting of things that the Amish people traditionally wouldn't do. But there were definitely moments in my life that uh, created tremendous change. 
Um, for example, when I turned 18, I went out and I bought my car, my first car. I saved up my money and I went out. I put a cash down payment because I had zero credit. Um, so I bought my first car. And when my father found out, he said, okay, so you either get rid of the car or you find somewhere else to live because we're not going to have you living at home if you have a car. And I said, okay. Um, at this point, I was, you know, I was very frustrated with the rules and didn't make sense to me. I was like, it doesn't make sense for me to follow rules just because somebody else follows them, just because my forefathers did things a certain way. It doesn't make sense for me to do them that way too. And it just, you know, my nature did not go well with following the rules. Um, so at that point I was like, okay, you know, I'm making my decision and moving out. And that's when I officially moved out. But even then I was, I was living a mile away from my parents' house. I was still, you know, uh, I had, I, my mother has a bakery. We were doing baking together every week. Um, so I would go home and work every week. And uh, so it was, it's kind of like a gradual, a gradual separation. And so how, because you just said that you were bowling with your peers and, and that was fine. Like how um, controlled is the environment? Like how free are you? Is it that, so you do have time during the day where you can go and go to the movies or you're not supposed, or go, go bowling. Like how, how, how free is it? Children are usually, usually spend a lot of time with their family um, when they would hang out, you know, when we would hang out with our friends, it was usually with our parents. Like we would go over to our cousin's house and we would all hang out. But then when you turn 16, you start hanging out with other teenagers. This is when uh, you kind of go out and make friends and you find the person you're going to marry. Um, all right. <laughs> Which is voluntary. Is that voluntarily or is that like a voontary um, yes, marriage there, there is no matching. there's no arrangement yeah, marriages no oh, arrangement. interesting okay um, but at that point you you know most of the kids go out on Saturday night and they go out and they go to they have to either go to a friend's house or they'll join up and they'll go up go out to a bowling alley or go out for ice cream or movies it's like a traditional um, time when you hang out with your friends. Sometimes there would be sleepovers Saturday night, but then Sunday you would usually either go to church or have like a very quiet day. And then there would be volleyball games and other activities on Sunday afternoon for all of the, uh, for all of the youth. And then there would be a dinner for everybody. And then everybody would sit down and sing songs. So, um, you know, all of that was pretty open. You were able to go out and, you know, hang out with your friends without parental supervision. Um, so there were definitely times, you know, you would tell them, oh, we're going to go to our friend's house, but then un you would <laughs> actually be going out to a movie or something. Right. So it was like typical teenager behavior where we would go out and just have fun. Right. And so when we speak about freedom, which is a wonderful thing, and we're very blessed to be in a country that is free, it can also mean that freedom can also be confusing, right? And in the Amish community, I believe that, well, it's clear that a lot of the decisions are made for you, like things you wear, what you buy, how you behave. So when you uh, were in Breaking Amish and you spent time in Florida, you got a DUI. And that way you can see that freedom is confusing. How do you define freedom and how has your concept of freedom changed over time? Well, freedom is certainly a responsibility. And something that, you know, I grew up in a very sheltered household. I was told how to dress, um, what to wear, how to act, where to go to, who to hang out with, you know. So, and I think a lot of parents would try to do that with their children. Um, but my life was extra strict. And I had to, you know, if my dress was two inches too short, I would get a lot of grief about that. And they would tell me that I needed to lengthen my dress. Mm. Um, so, you know, having that restricted childhood and then moving away from that, especially when I went to Florida and not having anybody, I had nobody around me. I didn't have parents around me. I didn't have family or friends that knew me. I was very on my own and I didn't have the experience to, uh, to know when to say, you know, to make my decisions firmly. And another thing that was very, that's very confusing after spending a life in such a restricted environment is um, you, you never know like when they're telling you don't do that because 
it's something that's uh, that goes against the rules or if it's something that is because it, it will actually harm you and it will put you in danger. So that was a distinction that I had to discover myself. So it's almost a, the di- difference between like moral danger and actual danger. Yes, it was very much so where, uh, and even morally, since the standards of, uh, of the way that you were supposed to act were so strict Um, it took me a while to decide where I wanted to be on that scale, like how strict I wanted to be with myself. I had to discover by myself, like, you know, those things are dangerous for everyone, no matter, you know, where they are in their life. And this is okay if it's okay with you and your ethics. So like, I definitely had to um, do that. And in the beginning, I was definitely a little bit like Icarus. And then you got a DUI. Yes. <laughs> or driving then, too close to the sun. <laughs> absolutely. And I got into trouble. I definitely got into a lot of trouble. Mm. And I learned a lot of things the hard way because it was the only way that I that I understood that I shouldn't be doing that. I mean, DUI was was stupid. It was I knew I shouldn't have been doing that. Right. But I think, uh, like I said, I think the difference understanding the difference between safety for myself and just, you know, having very strict ideas. I think just not understanding the difference between that, I think definitely led me to do things that I typically, I otherwise wouldn't have done. What was sort of the most shocking thing um, or yeah, what was the most shocking thing you experienced going from the Amish to New York City? Oh, so many culture, so many culture <laughs> <Yeah>. shocks. <laughs> <laughs> what um, 1000 things <laughs> so I mean there were so many things and I'm still learning so many things like things that I didn't realize were things but you know one thing that I found most shocking was how similar people are everywhere you mm. think you know I grew up and I kind of had this perception that people outside of the community were able to do what they wanted and you know kind of without judgment uh, right you know and I discovered that the tr- the human traits that you know define a society those are present everywhere you go so you just kind of have to figure out like what part of society you want to be with right. um, so I think that was one of the the biggest culture shocks hmm. and kind of technology wise yeah I mean I, I did have I did have a cell phone since I was 16 so ah, interesting. you know that that was back when I think we had razor phones. So you did have access to the internet and what are razor would, phones? Is that the flip the little flip phone? Oh yeah, the little flip phone. Yeah, the flip phones, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Back in the 2000s. <laughs> yeah. Um so I had a I had a phone since I was 16. I had some access to the internet. You know, I knew what Facebook and uh Facebook and Twitter and MySpace were at the time. So it wasn't like I didn't have any idea of what was going on. You know, I had a little DVD player. I did watch movies. I had an, iP- uh, an iPod and I listened to music. So I definitely had access to all of that, you know, to all of the culture and everything, but not to the extent where I was living in the middle of it. And I had, you know, unrestricted access to the world, which was right. really, uh, really interesting. Right. I, there was quite a funny um, moment uh, during the series where you step into an elevator. Was that really the first time you stepped into an elevator? I have no idea. I, I honestly, I don't <laughs> even know. I mean, so yeah, that, that series was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of things, uh, for example, you know, when you're filming a show, Mm -hmm. Um, the network has certain expectations and even if it doesn't match up with what's actually happening, they'll keep you in a room until you say (laughs) what they want you to say. So another thing, according to, uh, studies, Americans are now the unhappiest they've ever been or have been in the last 50 years. And, uh, studies also say that Americans lack a sense of community. And some would say that we've denaturalized ourselves so much that people seek to escape technology chains and binds part- participating in things such as digital detoxing or therapy to get rid of their technology addictions and it does make one things you know were the Amish onto something so what are things that you are grateful for growing up in the Amish community so I definitely think the Amish are onto something in terms of community if you spend any time in an Amish community, you'll see how close people are. 
and how much they depend on each other, how much they, um, you know, for example, in the middle of COVID, my mom was very depressed because they weren't having church services. She no longer was able to see the people that she went to church for. And, you know, she spent her entire life in the same town. So she knows all of those people very well. And that community is so important to, um, to the people within that. And it, they lean on each other when they're having a hard time, when they're struggling financially, uh, whatever the case is, they have each other and they know that, you know, they're there for each other. And that's something that I have not seen that level of community since I left. I mean, there, you know, there are definitely societies and cultures that, that prioritize that, but I guess I haven't really become a part of that. Um, but I think that's really hard to find. And I think it's an important part of being happy, but I will say, you know, it doesn't pre mean that depression doesn't happen doesn't in exist. the right. community. You yeah. know, I, I suffered with depression since I was 13. And, um, you know, so that's something that I've had to work through, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, your point about technology is very valid. You know, I no longer have to go to a modeling casting to know that I'm not the prettiest girl in the room. I don't have the prettiest clothes. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to go to a casting to be reminded that my thigh gap isn't as, as oh wonderful <laughs> as some other girls. I just have to open social media and it's right. all there and everybody hmm. looks so perfect. Um, you know, they're, everybody's filtered to the point where they, their skin looks flawless. So when you compare yourself to what you see on social media, and that's something that, you know, the majority of kids are growing up with these days. When you compare yourself to what you're seeing on social media, it's no wonder people are unhappy. And I struggle with that myself too. And I, I have to constantly remind myself that what you see on social media is not real life. Um, mm. And, you know, I know firsthand, like I, I've met some of the people that are in campaigns, um, you know, that are broadcast internationally. I've met them face to face and not even they look like the people in the campaigns. So it's just really important to remember that, you know, what you see on social media is not real life. Um, and also, you know, I've lived in the epi epicenter of it. I, you know, I was, when I, uh, back when I was in my modeling days, I was hanging out with people um, that, you know, are, you know, I would meet celebrities, I would go to all these fun parties, I would be, you know, working for designers and stuff like that. And it's a very empty experience if you don't have good people around you. And it just compels in comparison to, um, you know, finding a life and a lifestyle and finding yourself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that we all struggle with. But the things that I learned from the Amish community were just the value of the people around you and of connecting with nature. Um, and those are things that we all have access to. Right. Do you have any pets? I, I was don't just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I would love to have a dog. I used to have a dog, Victoria, but um, I actually, due to my living situation, it didn't yeah. work out for me to have a dog. So um, she's now living, she's even more spoiled than she was when she was living with me, but she, um, one of my friends adopted her because she was moving out of her home and she wanted a dog. So I was like, okay, this works out. Um, so I don't have any pets right now. <laughs> I can imagine that you miss uh, seeing a couple of the episode. I can imagine that you miss nature around you and, and animals. Oh, I spend a lot of time in nature. I, I make a point to, um, to go on walks. I think exercising regularly helps too. Uh, I notice it with myself when I stop exercising, even if it's for a week, I immediately notice a difference in my, uh, in my mood. So yeah. exercise is vital. Um, and just spending time off of the phone. Cause I, I personally know how addicting it is. It's so addicting. You, uh, especially when you, you know, become interested in certain events going around the world and you start, you know, reading more and you start seeing people's reactions and you kind of get interested in that. And, and you go down it, the snowballing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You go down all these rabbit holes and that yeah. is incredibly time consuming and can affect your mental health very quickly. Um, I actually, you know, this week, um, Shine released a report that they have a $100 billion valuation. Um, I don't know if you know who Shine is. It's this fast fashion company. 
Um, they're notorious for, you know, slave labor. And it's not like it's a secret, you know, like everybody knows that their their workers they're are not that, being paid right. fairly and people are, you know, outraged by it. But then, you know, the numbers don't lie. So, uh, you know, we, we all know what's going on, but people continue to buy it. And I kind of went, you know, I... Down kind that of, rabbit hole. <laughs> I went down that rabbit hole. And just this morning, I was like, okay... <sighs> Just Put your let phone it go, <laughs> my phone down, focus, you know, as long as I'm doing the right thing and I'm doing what I need to do, that's what matters, not what people on the internet are saying, or, you know, it doesn't matter. Like I need to stay focused and that's incredibly hard to do sometimes, but you have to put it away and you have to focus on what's in your life and what you're in control of. Right. I completely agree. And does that also mean that you go back to um, your family a lot? Do you go visit them a lot or how does that, how is your relationship with your family now? So I have been really fortunate with the way that my family handled me being on the show and me leaving and deciding to live a life outside of the community. They've been incredibly um, gracious about it. You know, they certainly mentioned the show in passing a couple of times, but I mean, I know that they don't, uh, you know, they weren't happy about it. But right. the way that they they prioritize their relationship with me and their time with me over, you know, getting their point across of how much they disapprove. Um, and that has allowed us to continue having a great relationship. So, you know, we're, you know, my mom is usually calls me, we write letters back and forth, and I try to visit as much as possible um, several times a year. So, you know, and just having that in the background and being able to revisit my family uh, a couple times a year is really valuable because it always brings me back to the person that I really am. And it reminds me of the values that they tried to instill in me. So I'm really fortunate about that. Excellent. That's beautiful. Um, another thing that uh, struck me was that um, you, one of the things that all of you, or at least um, you brought with you when you moved to New York, um, was the Bible, the Holy Bible. And I was very curious what your relationship to faith is nowadays, because I can imagine that, you know, some adherents of like all encompassing faiths um, and faith that require a deep penetration of one's daily life find it challenging to maintain a religious life that is less than all encompassing. How, what is your relationship with faith? So I definitely was a little overfed with religion when I was younger. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, my father being a minister, I would usually be sitting in church and listening to my father uh, speak to the uh, to the people about the Bible. And he would be studying the Bible. And usually when he thought that I was doing something wrong, he would quote scripture um, and tell me like, this is why you can't do that, you know? And so... Um, my relationship with faith, I feel like is, you know, when I moved to New York City, I had the opportunity to meet so many people from uh, so many different cultural and religious backgrounds. And I found that each of them had such valuable um, kind of insight into what they consider to be important. And in addition to that, I did a religions course and what I found most interesting. Oh, you did? Yeah. So oh, interesting. it was a really interesting course. And I thought I would, I, I was afraid I wouldn't like it because again, like my father was a minister. So I, I'm not like entirely, I don't entirely love spending a lot of time studying religion, but I wanted to understand the world as a whole uh, when it come, came to religion. And it really helped me come to terms with my own background and, you know, kind of like it was kind of a negative relationship with religion. Um, and the most interesting thing that I found was that in each religion, they all have their own kind of idea of God and they all believe that their own version is the one and only God that is on the earth. So I find that aspect of religion very important. And another thing that I kind of think about all the time is people use religious teachings all the time and manipulate it to meet what they would like to see in the world and to fit their agendas. And, you know, I grew up seeing people using scripture to 
excuse bad behavior, excuse their own transgressions. For example, uh, when men wanted their wives to listen to them, they would quote scripture of, you know, the man is the leader of the household, and then they would quote the Bible. Right. Um, so that's my relationship with religion. I mean, I, I'm very spiritual. I, and at the end of the day, like, I just believe that just be a good person, be the best person that you can be in your life. And, um, you know, I, maybe my spiritual journey is incomplete, but that's where I am right now. <laughs> So you don't identify with one faith no, in particular? No, I don't. I, I mean, to me, I just, I don't think that we as humans uh, know, like, all the answers. So, you know, me personally, um, I like to kind of stay open and just believe that we should just focus on being good people, like, to start out with. Right. <laughs> And um, on to something else. Um, you are a very successful model and you've appeared in magazine nations nationwide. Um, and one of the most surprising features, uh, which you probably talked about a lot already, uh, was probably being on the cover of Maxim. How did you bridge that enormous cultural gap between having just left the Amish and being on the cover of a magazine that promotes most of the things of which the Amish disapprove? Yes. I mean, if you think of Maxim, you think of, you know, you think of a sexier version of a yeah. magazine. Naked woman. Um, yes. <laughs> Half like, naked woman. Yes, right. absolutely. That's Fast immediately cars. what comes to mind. Right. Um, but I was actually very fortunate to, you know, when I think of that shoot and I think of the life after that in the modeling world, I think I was actually very fortunate to have that shoot because the entire Maxim team, the photographer, the makeup artist, the stylist, everybody on the team was so incredibly professional and friendly and business minded, um, which was rather rare in the fashion industry at that point. Um, and it just kind of set the tone and my expectations of what a photo shoot should feel like and what and how it should be conducted. And that this wasn't just, just because the woman is in a relatively sexy uh, outfit does not mean that the energy in the room should reflect that, you know? So it was... And it's also not, it's not that you were naked. I mean, you were still... Yes, <laughs> but, you know, even, even if I would have, you know, the way that they interacted with me, the way that they mm -hmm. treated me, they treated me like, you know, with respect and integrity. And I think that really helped me navigate photo shoots after that. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think back to certain photo shoots after that, where photographers weren't necessarily as professional, and I think back to the way that I handled it, just un subconsciously without even, you know, realizing what was going on or thinking about what was going on. Um, you know, one in instance that I think of in particular is um, there was a photographer, you know, he contacted my agency, wanted to shoot, shoot a model. He had photography equipment that he was going to send back the next day. And he was like, you know, let's do, let's do a test shoot. I arrived at his house and, you know, we took a couple test pictures and, and then he said he wanted to take a break. And I noticed he was kind of hitting on me. And I just, mm -hmm. you know, in my mind, I was at a photo shoot. He was a photographer. This was, you know, this was a business thing. We were working. And I just remember like him kind of giving up and being like, wow, you're really professional. And like, I never really thought about that until much later. And I was like, okay, like, you know, and I, I hear stories coming out of the modeling industry and I, I now realize like what he was trying to do. And mm -hmm. the fact that I had that experience with the Maxim team that helped prepare me for that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for that opportunity. And would you ever do it again? Let's say if they asked you tomorrow. <laughs> well, well, I'm about a decade older, and I certainly, and you still look great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think I would be interested. <laughs> Maybe if they would put me in a gown, <laughs> in your own gown. <laughs> yeah. And and did people at home see the pictures? I don't know. I mean, nobody ever mentioned the Maxim shoot to me, so I don't know if they know about it. Interesting. If they, like if they saw it, I or if no they just clue. kind of, yeah. I have no clue. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I want to talk about you and your business and, and how you got to where you are now um, with your own fashion line. 
Um, you studied at FIT, um, which is a major accomplishment, so kudos for that. Uh, after that, you interned at Cynthia Rowley. Um, you were an assistant product designer, Jason Wu, and then started your own line, uh, which you um, showcased at New York Fashion Week. How did those learning experiences change your view on fashion? Well, I certainly still have a lot to learn. And that's something that, you know, when you're a business, you know, an entrepreneur, when you go out and start your own business, you know that the learning never ends. But the things that I learned at Cynthia Rowley and Jason Wu definitely helped me a lot tremendously. Um, One of the things that I learned from Cynthia Rowley was, you know, I have a lot of respect for the way that she conducted her business. I worked in the des- on the design floor and I, you know, I would overhear her interactions with her employees and she always remained very cool, very focused on business. Um, and one of the things that she did that not a lot of designers do is she acknowledged the intern. She said, good morning to us. And she treated us like part of the team. And right. that alone just made the communication in the design floor, it made it flow more smoothly. And it released a lot of the tension that is that kind of happens when, you know, because often designers don't want to be bothered by the interns. They don't want to say hello. They don't want to talk to them. And they make it very clear that you are not to speak to them directly. And that um, is very quickly noticed and creates tension. And Cynthia Rowley did the opposite. And just seeing her do that and operate in that way um, was, you know, I have a lot of respect for that. Um, the way that she treated her employees. And then, you know, at Jason Wu, one of the things, you know, I started working under one of the product development uh, designers and she was one of those people where she didn't care about your social skills. She didn't care about the way that you looked or, you know, what your background was. She cared about, were you willing to do the job and were you going to work hard to get it done? And she stayed focused on business and she taught me so many things from, you know, from production and everything from the sketch all the way to the fashion week and market week. And just having that experience with her was tremendous. And then launching your own line. What did you learn? (laughs) I mean, that's a big question. (laughs) I'm still at the very beginning in terms of like building a fashion brand. I am still like in the very beginning. And I, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of research and trying to figure out how I can build a brand that is built on what I prioritize in fashion. And I keep learning about new things and new things that I can do and ways that I can incorporate the change that I want to see in the industry just in terms of fair wages, the way that the textiles are sourced and things like, you know, the way things are sold and marketed and things like that. So I don't have a lot of resources. Um, You know, I'm I'm building my brand from the ground up without any outside uh, financial investments. So there are so many things that I want to do and that I, that I feel like I should have already done that I haven't been able to do yet simply because time just, there's just never enough time in the day. And do you do you make all your pieces yourself? How does um, that work? So I have outsourced samples, and I you know I work with seamstresses, local seamstresses. Um, you know, I tr- do the majority of the work myself uh, until you know if I have too much work on my on my hands and I can't do it all myself, I have people that I bring in. Um, but you know, in the you know, fair paying people fair wages, I don't bring people in unless I can pay them what I think that they're worth. So you know, I put my money where my mouth is, and I firmly believe that everybody in my company should be fairly paid. So you know, I think that's very important. But it also does make it harder for me to scale and to uh, have professional photography for everything. Um, so it's difficult to have morals. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it makes it a lot harder, but I think, you know, in this economy, you're, you know, we're basically competing against fast fashion companies. And, um, at the end of the day, like, I don't want to be a part of this industry unless I can do things the way that I think they should be done. So I would prefer, 
uh, going a little more slowly and figuring it out than, you know, rushing into things. Do you use the Amish community to make some of your clothes or not? I, you mean like seamstresses? Like help, yeah, or help the, or your family helps, uh, does your family help you sew or? I do not. I have thought of using, I have thought of um, having them make quilts mm. because they make these beautiful quilts and right. I have thought of doing that and. I think that would be very cool. Yeah, I think it would yeah. be awesome. I mean, yeah. if you've ever been in Lancaster County and you ever go to a quilt shop, I haven't. you'll see the pieces that they make. It's beautiful. And they do all this hand stitching on the quilts. I mean, those are beautiful heirloom pieces that you're going to want to keep for the rest of your life. So I have thought of bringing them in and you know having them create pieces, but I, do not, I don't work with them in terms of the garments that I create mm-hmm. um, because a lot of the techniques that are used for the clothes are very, they're rather advanced and you need uh, specific training and skills. You know, handling silk is rather difficult. difficult. <laughs> so I don't think a lot of the Amish women would have training. Um, it's very specialized. You know, the, the garments are very specialized. So um, I need people that have extensive experience in luxury garments to make the, to make the clothes. And when did you start sewing? Uh, So I started sewing when I was nine years old. Um, You know, the vast majority of Amish women make all the clothes in the family. So I started by making my own dresses. I, you know, I was making quilts and things for around the house, um, clothes for my brothers and things like that. And I've been sewing ever since. Uh, I've been sewing for almost 20 years, (laughs) which is a long time. That's a long time. It is a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, we would also sew quilts, you know, that was, that was something that all the women spent, spent a lot of time on, uh, repurposing old clothes into, you know, they would wash and clean the fabrics and sew them into quilts and back them with fleece for, uh, to donate to charity. So we spent a lot of time doing that. And, um, can you remember the first time you were able to pick a piece of clothing that did not correspond with the Amish requirements? Because you, you mentioned before in the beginning of the conversation that all rules about clothing are quite strict, right? Yes. So, you know, back to the age of 16, where you start hanging out with your friends, maybe going to the bowling alley or the movie theater. Um, back then, it was fun for us to wear a pair of jeans and a T-shirt. And, you know, we wouldn't stand, we didn't stand out as much at the bowling alley. We'd fit in a little bit more. We wouldn't get made fun of by the other kids in the bowling alley. So, right. um, but yes, I still remember, you know, going out for the first time. I was wearing blue uh, bell-bottom jeans and a white tank top. And I felt like I was the coolest kid in the world. So <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. So and what's, fun your, dressing up. what's your favorite piece of garment? right now like piece of clothing like ever yeah like if you could yeah um I I mean it always goes back to you know I believe in a very classic garment that will last for years um I I don't know that's hard to say I mean it depends on the day and the season exactly (laughs) but yes you know a dress that would transcend all seasons is probably like a black crepe back silk with uh, spaghetti straps you know, a little bit longer. It's a very chic silhouette that will, you're not gonna have to worry about it being outdated. Um, that's probably my favorite piece right now. I would, is that the way you would describe your, the style of your own pieces? Um, so I'm definitely still finding the exact style of the garments that I want to sell. Um, you know, it's definitely influenced by the modern working woman that is very confident of herself. And uh, I believe that, you know, I believe in a very well-made garment that doesn't necessarily call attention to it. You see it and you think it's beautiful and it flows beautifully, but it doesn't distract from the woman so much that you don't see her for who she is. Um, I, and I try to um, allow the person to kind of shine in the garments. I mean, the top that I'm wearing right now is a little bit more extravagant. Um, it's beautiful. <laughs> I've seen it on the top, but um, and it kind of it's a bit of a step away from what I usually aim towards. But I would say the style of the woman that I try to dress, I 
I was in Capri, I was getting my breakfast ready and I look over and there's this woman standing there just checking out the, some of the fruits on the table. And she was wearing this like dark green silk jumpsuit. It covered most of her body. It wasn't like it was revealing or flashy or anything, but just the way that she carried herself and the way that her, just her presence was just so strong and beautiful and elegant. And I think of that woman all the time when I am making clothes because I'm not necessarily um, designing for a style of clothing, but more for a type of woman that I want to see wearing these clothes. And I want to recreate that memory uh, in my own way. Did you go up to her and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not. I didn't, I didn't talk to her. Uh, you know, we briefly interacted at a, at a later time and she was... She was just very chic and not, you know, not loud in the way that she was presenting herself. Um, because a lot of times when people want to wear luxury clothes or when they want attention, they would wear something skin bearing, something skin tight or, you know, something flashy. And, and that's how they get your attention. But just that interaction made me realize that, uh, you know, a really good, strong garment is something that will help emphasize the woman in it. So that's what I aspire towards. <laughs> right, and enhance the person. Yes, enhance the person yeah, and excellent. make her just confident and be able to move freely and do what she needs to do. And how would you define success for your fashion line? What would happen, at what point would you say, okay, that's, uh, I've done it all now. This is what I wanted to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've reached the point where I don't think of success as like a single point in a life. You know, like if you think of a relationship, like what is a successful relationship? It's not a single moment. Right, it's um, a transient. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's continuous and it requires continuous input. And when I think of a successful brand um, with the climate that we're currently in, you cannot say, oh, my brand is successful because you can't predict what's going to happen next month. You know, COVID especially taught us that, you know, designers were importing evening wear and the second COVID hit, sales flatlined except for um, pajamas. So it's kind of hard to predict and, you know, you can do the best you can. But I think success for a brand is to be profitable. And, you know, it's really hard to run a profitable fashion business. So if you can be profitable in your fashion business while do, doing things um, you know, up to your moral stand, moral and ethical standards. Um, I think that's success. Are um, there any um, public figures or celebrities that you would love to dress? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not all of them, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are certainly, you know, certainly a lot of people that I would aspire to dress. I mean, could you, you know, name someone? <laughs> uh, off the top of my head, I mean. Um, I mean, I've always been a big fan of Rihanna. She's incredible. Ah, interesting. Yeah. I really wouldn't, I wouldn't have guessed you say that. Yeah, I mean, her style is very different from mine, mm -hmm. but I think she just makes a garment. Like she, no matter what she wears, she just looks incredible. Right. And I think anybody that has the opportunity to style or dress her, it's just, you know, just to see your garment on, on a woman like that would be incredible. I think Kate Blanchett would look excellent in your dresses. Oh yeah, she's beautiful. She's she's beautiful. she's beautiful, and she has. When you were just talking about that elegance of that woman that you saw in Capri, she has that elegance too. Right. Like that, just everlasting. Anyways, you are active in the nonprofit world as well. Um, you're a board member of the nonprofit organization uh, Developing Faces. What is the purpose of this nonprofit? So Developing Faces is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that provides high quality surgical care to babies and children uh, with facial abnormalities living in developing countries around the world. And what we do is uh, we go to countries that might not have and typically don't have the access to health care, um, whether it's because of financial restraints or because the healthcare system in those countries hasn't been uh, developed enough to take care of some of those uh, issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've been in Guatemala most recently, 
And there specifically, you have children being born with cleft palate and cleft lip, which is a relatively uh, common abnormality that happens everywhere in the world. And usually in the United States, it usually gets repaired within the first three months. Mm -hmm. What happens when it doesn't get repaired is these children continue living with these abnormalities and they really struggle uh, for the rest of their lives. And, you know, one of the cases that uh, I'll never forget was an 18 year old boy. He had a cleft palate the size bigger than a quarter on the, on the roof of his mouth. He wasn't able to speak properly. He wasn't able to swallow properly or eat properly. So for his, for the first 18 years of his life, he had a hole going from the, the nose down into the palate. And oh, wow. this made it incredibly difficult difficult for him to fit into social situations. And his parents were, you know, obviously wanted to, to have that taken care of. But first of all, they didn't have a doctor locally that was able to perform this procedure. And B, they didn't have the financial resources to travel to the United States to have the surgery performed there. So right. it was never done. And this happens too many times. So that's what we do. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of, um, I listened to an NPR uh, podcast the other day, and it was about Donald Laub, and he's this chief of surgery at Stanford University, and um, he started to create these travels, just like you mentioned, um, uh, to Mexico to perform reconstructive surgery, also with the cleft, um, cleft lips. Um, because often those societies, just like you said, they ostracize kids that have it, right? Mm -hmm. And they say it's the devil's work sometimes. Yes. Um, and he explains this moral dilemma that he had because he had to perform surgery, or not had to. The mother of this, um, I think, 13-year-old boy um, wanted the boy to have the surgery, but the boy um, had a arrhythmic arrhythmia, I think, in his heart. So the, the surgery was going to be quite... Um, dangerous for him. Eventually they did it and the boy died. So yeah, I know, I know, heartbreaking. So yeah. and the conversation, that podcast, if you're interested, I'll send it to you. But the, the conversation is about the moral dilemma that he faced because if this didn't happen to, if the boy didn't get the operation, he would be ostracized for the rest of his life. He wouldn't fit into society. Right. It's such a, it's such an impressive organization that you do that. Do you still go um, on trips? So we had a mission planned in March of 2020. Um, oh, no. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, the week we, <laughs> uh, all the supplies were on the, on the table, ready to go. The flights were booked. Uh, you know, the entire uh, team was assembled. And this was back when COVID was really bad in the United States. It still hadn't really entered Guatemala at the and they basically said well you can come but we're not going to let you into the country which was completely <laughs> understandable yeah um, so the mission was canceled and we are currently looking at dates you know it takes a significant amount of time and energy and resources to put it all together right yeah and also connecting and working with the government of whichever country you're entering into um, so we want to make sure that we are at a point where we can do that safely and where we're not going to be spending the financial resources to set this up before we can actually do it. So, right. I mean, that should happen within the next year. Uh, we're not quite at that point yet. Um, you know, another thing that you, that happens is if a patient tests COVID positive, they don't operate on that patient because the risk of mortality goes up significantly. Um, so, you know, the, the number of cases in the country that we're visiting needs to come down to a point where we don't have to worry about all the patients having COVID because, you know, at that point you can't do surgery on them no matter what. So, and also does it mean that you would have to test them before you do surgery? So I guess you would also spend money on testing and, and all those things? Absolutely. I mean, there are at-home tests um, that are becoming a little bit more available right now. So that's probably what would happen. But, you know, we're kind of waiting until we get to the point where cases are down to a comfortable level. But that is something that, um, you know, we don't really hear about is there, there are a significant number of charities that go to these countries to perform surgical care. And that isn't happening. That hasn't happened since COVID. So for two years, 
that surgical work has has stopped and children continue to be born, cases continue to pile up. So the situation, you know, continues to snowball a little bit. So I'm really looking forward to getting back into it. Right. It sounds like there's a lot of work to be done. And how, how would people be able to get involved? So the best way to get involved with a charity is number one, uh, donations, and number two, helping to spread the word, because both of those are the hardest thing for a charity to do. Um, especially with a surgical mission like this. I mean, there is the administrative work, which I participate in. Right. I was um, just going to ask you what, because you don't have a, a medical background. No, but I, what do you... I don't have a medical background. <laughs> and I also don't know how to speak Spanish, which right. I, when I went on the mission trip, I was like, oh, I, I can help, you know, bring patients in, have them do paperwork. It's probably more important than you think. Yeah. And I didn't know a word of Spanish. They didn't know a word of English. <laughs> yeah. So there was nothing there I, the, the, you know, I couldn't help. So I was, you know, kind of organizing supplies and things like that. But, um, you know, there's, you know, throughout the year, there's a significant amount of planning, especially when it comes to fundraiser events. Yes, the events are fun, but the planning, <laughs> wow, it's a lot of work. <laughs> and it's a lot yeah. of, um, and what I will say people can do is, go to charity events, just go. You don't have to know the people to go, just go right. on to um, show up. What is it? Eventbrite. And, yeah, yeah. you know, search for charitable organizations in your area, Ch search for events, buy a ticket, go have a fun night. And that's how you help them, you know, and you have, you know, you spend a hundred dollars on a ticket for a dinner. And um, to some people, that's a lot of money to some people. It's not a lot of money, but that's the best way to help them is to, you know, support charity, charity events, uh, donate money and help raise awareness. How much money would it cost to fix one cleft lip? Uh, that Do you know? highly depends on oh, how severe the case is. Well, it depends on how many cases can be done throughout the week, because, you know, say we go to Guatemala for one week and. Uh, we can, you know, the team can do a certain number of cases during that week. And it really depends on how smoothly the cases go. If they're more complicated, it takes a, takes a bit longer. Um, sometimes there are other supplies that need to be used. Uh, so some supplies are very expensive, which makes the uh, surgery a little bit more expensive. So it highly depends on how long the surgery takes, how many other cases can be done. Um, you know, what the surgeons are, you know, are really good at is seeking out the most complicated cases and trying to make the biggest impact for the amount of work that is put in. Um, what they could do is they could go and, um, you know, there are hundreds of patients that show up. They have gross on their faces, gross on the fingers, you know, uh, they want things removed and things like that. So what they could do is they could bang out a large number of cases and get of and simple, take care of simple people. cases, right? Yes. Or, they can, what they try to do is they try to focus on the, on the cases that are the most extreme and what will make the biggest difference in their lives. Um, so, you know, if you take that approach, then the price per surgery does go up a little bit. But what I can say is every single dollar that goes in is spent very carefully. I don't get paid for the work that I do. None of the officers get paid. Um, and we're very strict with funds. We make sure that every single dollar goes towards supplies and essential things that are needed to, you know, carry out the mission. Yeah. And you really make a big difference in somebody's life. Yeah. And we actually uh, or onboarded a neurosurgeon uh, with the charity. So that's going to allow the surgical team to perform more complicated surgeries involving the skull and the brain. Uh, which is really exciting. Wow. Well done. Yeah. I have some uh, questions about your personal life. Um, what is your view on having a family? Oh, I love kids. I love Oh, really? Kids. Yes, absolutely love kids. I was kids. so curious kids what you were going me. to say. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, I think having children is such a beautiful responsibility. Um, I mean... You know, I spent the majority of the last decade on television. So I know one thing, uh, you know, the world will not see when I have children <laughs> because <laughs> I really uh, value the relationship that I had with my parents in terms of 
there was nobody else involved in our relationship. It was kept to the family. The issues that arose were kept to the family. And I remember how impressionable I was and how intimidated and shy. And I, I have very vivid memories of my own childhood. And when I see children, those issues being broadcast on social media, um, I worry about those children. Um, you know, I don't judge what the parents are doing, but I do know that I do not wish to take a part of that. And I think that um, it's very important for families to, whether or not you put your kids on social media or not, it's very important to um, remain focused on the relationship, the actual relationship off screen. Right. So that's one vow. That's one um, priority that I have. Would you, would that mean that you wouldn't give your kids cell phones? Oh, I mean, eventually I, you know, but in the, you know, I think the idea of sharing a child's image on the internet before they have the opportunity to say whether or not they would like the world to see that picture. That's just my personal philosophy. Uh, other people can do whatever they want, but like, that's probably one of the most important things I think about when I think of children. I actually think, you know, I don't have children, but one day I do want to have children. And I think that I would just deny them a cell phone until they're 18 years old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if that's possible, you know, in this yeah. age, but um, that's what I would like to believe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know, I know some people are like, well, you need it for safety. You know, like they'll, they'll give like, uh, I know. Like, like a, a one button phone. Yeah, I know a friend that, you know, I think her daughter is 11 or 12 and they gave her like just a working phone so that she can call somebody, right. uh, but no social media on it. So I think that's a smart option until they go out and they buy their own cell phone. Yeah, but <laughs> right? then they're off by themselves. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's interesting to think about, though. Um, and what um, how will the values that um, you will teach your children compare to the values you learned from your parents? I learned a lot of great things from my parents and I learned a lot of things that I do not wish to share. Um, you know, I think every situation, it, it's easy to say like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But I think right. it kind of depends on like the individual situation and like what happens, circumstances and things like that. So um, I think you just have to do the best you can. <laughs> and, <laughs> and do you know how many kids you want? Or is that also something that will just happen? Two kids. <laughs> Two kids? <laughs> Two kids. <laughs> Nothing more. <laughs> nice. I grew okay, up in a big family. I was a middle child and I don't want to, I don't want to recreate that. <laughs> how many siblings do you have? I have six siblings. Six siblings. Oh my God. Yes. Wow. I always have the feeling that the bigger the family is, the better. <laughs> but maybe there is yeah, such I mean, a thing I as too. That's, that, that's a personal thing. Yeah. But it's also because I never experienced it, right? Yeah. So maybe I mean, it's just a fantasy. And again, it's like, what are your circumstances? Like, what you know? What exactly. What can you, you afford? Have? Also, if yeah. you have the financial resources to have a big family, and uh, you know, like I love to travel, but the idea of taking seven children on a trip to wherever, <laughs> like, it's just not going to happen. Tricky. So maybe I'm prioritizing. <laughs> Uh, you know, my happiness, but I don't know, like, if you're not happy, then what's the point? <laughs> right. So I think you just have to decide like what you want to do, like what you want. And when we talk about happiness, what fulfills you most these days? Um, what fulfills me most these days is, you know, spending time with the people that I love and in my work, you know, I used, when I, entered the world of fashion, I certainly didn't understand a lot of things. I didn't understand the way that the industry works or what was important, what I was going to prioritize. Um, and as I continue working in the industry, uh, just the sheer challenge of coming up with solutions to the problems that I see um, is very fulfilling to me. And I keep, you know, I'm not going to lie, like I've questioned my position in the fashion industry many times. Like, why am I participating in an industry that is to blame for a large portion of the world's pollution? And I think of 
okay, so I can either leave or I can stay and I can try to be the change that I would want to see from the fashion industry. Um, right now, fashion is very ugly. What's going on with uh, the way workers are treated, um, the way that you know we have overconsumption issues. We are at the point where workers in the United States, there are hundreds of, not even hundreds, thousands of fashion students graduating every year and they can't get fair paying jobs because all of the jobs have gone overseas and we are now competing directly with uh, workers that are getting paid slave wages. And people think that that's a fashion industry problem. It's not, this is a global issue that keeps getting worse year after year after year. And just trying to think of solutions to combat that problem um, is very fulfilling to me. Um, I don't know, like, do we have a little bit of time to talk about definitely that? Okay. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, you know, this past week, uh, one of the world's, well, not even one of the world's, the world's biggest uh, fast fashion company, they're called Shine. They released a hundred billion dollar valuation. And it mm. is uh, such That's a, a lot of money. Amount. That is a hundred <laughs> billion dollar valuation. Incredible. For, clothing, the majority of their clothes are made out of fossil fuels and oils. They're not even made out of cotton or silk or anything like that. It's, mm -hmm. and when you buy, when you buy the clothes, um, the majority of the clothes don't fit the majority, many of the customers that buy the clothes, if something happens, they don't like the clothes, whatever, good luck sending it back. Good luck getting your money back. Um, so a lot of the clothes end up just getting thrown away. Um, and you know, people, find it they they're like well why should we be outraged you know we have the right to fashionable clothing we have the right to have access to pretty things so that we can be a part of society and we can take cute pictures for instagram and things like that and um you know it's it isn't just the fashion industry's problem this directly affects people working in all industries as well um and i had an interesting argument with somebody on social media, which is not a very smart thing to do. Um, but I, you know, I commented on that picture of Shine having the $100 billion valuation. And I said, this is a very clear reminder of the fact that people claim to care about sustainability, but we all can see where they're spending their money. And that is exactly where their priorities are. And basically one person was like, you know, the argument she was making was, well, low income people should have access to fashion and should have access, you know, they have the right to wear garments. And I said, well, you should just, you know, if you can't afford to buy sustainably produced or fairly, you know, garments that have been made by fairly paid workers, then just go to a secondhand store like Goodwill or Salvation Army and buy directly from them. That is a way to have access to clothes. They're cheap. And they're often better quality than what you would get at a fast fashion brand. And, you know, I don't say this lightly. Like I, I grew up, I started my personal journey out making $7.50 an hour. Um, and I have worked incredibly hard. I come from a very poor family. And the way that I was able to dress myself is I, I did exactly that. I went to secondhand stores and that's how I sourced my clothing. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I think that you can get, you have access to so many clothes right now. We have so many uh, websites um, where you can easily access secondhand clothes, um, there really is no excuse for, uh, you know, the argument that low-income people need access to fashion as well is not a valid argument for saying that fast fashion companies should exist. And then another argument she was making, um, which I have seen time and time again, and it seems to be kind of a shift. This is something that I haven't seen before. Um, but it's just an obvious uh, public declaration of saying that it is okay that people making the garments are slaves. That's completely okay because we deserve to have access to fashion. And is that me, how she said it? That's how she said it. That's, I mean, it wasn't, that's not word for word, but that was the point that she kept making. Right. Was, okay, so what? You know, it's not our problem, it's the, it's the corporation's problem. You know, we should have access to fast fashion just because slaves are making it doesn't mean that we shouldn't buy it. 
Um, and it's a pretty intense uh, statement. I mean, it's a pretty intense like <laughs> yeah. hill to die on that yeah. slavery should continue to exist for a non-essential clothing item that you're going to wear once for an Instagram picture. I mean, it was, and I haven't seen that argument before. It seems, especially over the past year, that kind of sentiment has snowballed. And this wasn't just, you know, an uneducated person that isn't interested in human rights. I went to her Instagram profile and she was advocating for fair wages in America. She was advocating for women's rights. She was, you know, she was an artist herself. She was obviously very interested in promoting that type of humanity. But to her... Didn't apply that to her. Yes. Of... To, so to her, the issue of slavery, since it was around, you know, on the other side of the world and not in her backyard, she wasn't seeing it. She felt like she was benefiting from it. It was okay to her. So I haven't seen that type of argument until recently. And it seems like that kind of consumer mindset is becoming worse and worse. It's not getting better. Right. You that, know, the, uh, so, that, the, that the arguments are getting more aggressive. I mean, the arguments are becoming a lot more entitled and a lot more um, you know, like I deserve to have easy access to trends. I deserve to have easy access to clothes. And I think clothing is a right. I think everybody should have access to fairly priced clothes. I think that is absolutely paramount that everybody has clothes in which they can feel comfortable in, go to job interviews and everything like that. But that's not what shine is. They have like, you know, they basically have club dresses and like sexy, low slick pieces of fabric, you know, it's not, they're not essential items. Right. It's just such a stark reminder of where the consumer mindset is and where we're going in fashion. And, you know, 10, almost 10 years ago was the Rana Plaza collapse. And everybody in fashion was like, oh, we're going to make a big difference. We're going to make all these goals of sustainability. We're going to change everything. We're going to, we're going to make sure, you know, Victoria's Secret was like, we're going to make sure that all of our workers are being paid fairly. And, Wasn't uh, Victoria's Secrets? Um, I think I read someplace that they, whenever customers return their items, they just throw them away because it costs more to get, like, to re to put the items back in store yes. than uh, pay a, a worker to create the uh, the garment. Yeah, or I mean, the, or the so piece of well, the, the underwear. <laughs> yeah, so basically that was a statement they made in 2013. They were going to change everything, and ensure uh, fair wages for their um for their workers we're in 2022 where are we at with that initiative and i keep seeing that over and over again so i just want to say like there is nothing that will ever excuse slave wages and it it also directly affects everybody in the united states because if companies can just outsource their labor to companies that pay you know a small fraction of what they would pay an unskilled labor in the united states they're, that's what they're going to do. So if you are thinking of the jobs and the economy in, the, in America, you also have to be advocating for fair wages around the world because that flimsy little shirt that you're, you know, you're going to wear, it pales in comparison to this ability of a fair paying job for yourself. So it doesn't just affect people in fashion. I wish people would understand that. And what do you, where do you stand on the argument um, where people say you can't get, or, you know, in regards to sweatshops and people say um, you can't get rid of sweatshops because when you close sweatshops, you would deny people from the only job they have available to them. Well, that is a significant issue um, that is only made worse by not purchasing paying people yeah. fairly. Right. The only reason why these people keep working at the factory isn't because they love their job. It's because it's the only job that is available in that community. And the job itself is not the problem. It's the amount of money they are being paid. Um, I, I don't have anything against factories, but I think if you work in a factory, um, you should be getting paid fair wages. And Another thing that people forget is these people have no unions. They have no resource. They get raped on the job. They have nowhere to go. They, they can either 
you know, they can't even make a report. They just have to shut up and get back to work. And, and show up the next morning, right? And show up the next morning. And if they don't want to continue, they can go home. But in that case, they're not going to have, they're not going to have a job. They're not going to be able to pay. And the thing is, these jobs don't pay enough for people to, to save up money to go to a community where they would get paid a fair wage. Um, you know, they barely have enough money to send their, to put food on the table, much less, you know, spend for medical, spend on medical supplies, send their kids to school and things like that. So it's a really serious problem. And, you know, this, when we talk about sustainability and fashion, we're not just talking about the mountains and mountains and mountains of clothes that are being thrown away because nobody wants them because they're, they're worthless. You know, half of the clothes that are being donated are complete, they're trash. And, um, you know, the other 50%, they're getting thrown away because nobody wants them. So this argument of, oh, we need, you know, we need cheap clothes so that low income people can clothe themselves. Guess what? There's a whole mountain of that clothing already made. Like you don't need to shop fast fashion in order to have access to that. It's they're, they're already out there. They're already in the universe. Right. And you're right. It's possible to, um, because when I, where I grew up, uh, we went to the Salvation Army to get yeah. clothes, right? Yeah. And we got clothes for one dollar a piece, and I wore that dress, uh, wore, that, wore that sweater um, the whole year, right? Exactly. So there exactly. are there are options. And another thing is, if you want access to good clothes, stop buying the clothes that you know. Stop supporting the economy that increases the number of fast fashion clothes. And what would happen then is those companies would no longer be profitable. People would start, you know, if what we really need is we need uh, consumers to stand up for fair wages and everybody thinks that, oh, well, I'm just one customer. I'm not going to make a big difference in that $100 billion. Let me tell you, as a small business owner, every single order is important. Every single order makes a big difference in a small business and your dollar does count. So don't think that just because you're spending 20 bucks that, you know, your dollar doesn't matter. It does matter. So if you want to make a change, you want better clothes, then start investing in economies that support that idea. And what will happen is um, better clothing will be produced and better clothing will enter secondhand shops. Right now, if you walk into a secondhand store, the majority of it is fast fashion and nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. So like, if you want nice clothes, then stop fa shopping fast fashion and buy the high quality garments secondhand. And trust me, that will increase your access to better garments will increase. I think it, it's very interesting to hear you talk about this and how motivated you are to make a difference in, in the industry. Yeah, I mean, I every single day, this is what I work towards. And, and by no means, you know, and I, whenever I speak about this and become very adamant about my support for fair wages, everybody, you know, people start attacking my brand and being like, oh, well, you're doing this, you know, like how are we supposed to, you know, afford a $7,000 gown? I'm not expecting you to buy from my brand. I, what I'm saying is, you know, support sustainable fashion in whatever way that means to you, whether that's shopping secondhand or shopping from people that make fair wage promises, whatever that is to you. Um, you know, support it that way. And by no means am I perfect in my brand either. There, there's so many things that I, you know, that I think of myself doing and I'm like, wait, if I would do it this way, you know, that would improve the, you know, decrease the environmental impact, but I already have that product made or I have the fabric already in house. I'm not going to throw it away just because I realized that I could do it better. So there, you know, by no means am I like, you know, here saying like, oh, I'm on a high horse and doing everything right. No, 100% the opposite. But I think we need to do the very bare minimum. And that is stand up for uh, fairly paid workers. And the price of garments wouldn't increase that much. You know, you double their wage and it's it goes from like one dollar to two dollars. That's not yeah, to, that not to that 120 probably. Yeah. yeah, not that significant. Yeah. Kate, thank you for the conversation. Um, I really enjoyed speaking with you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me.